As Kenya marks the 52nd independence anniversary today, President Uhuru Kenyatta and his deputy William Ruto rallied behind Treasury Cabinet Secretary and the Anti-Corruption Commission, saying opposition leader Raila Odinga must prove his claims on Eurobond cash. Raila has refused to appear before the anti-graft body to give evidence on his allegations that up to 140 billion shillings of the sovereign bond money was lost. But Uhuru and Ruto now say Raila cannot use the Eurobond allegations to gain political mileage while refusing to give evidence. President Uhuru Kenyatta led Kenyans in marking the 52nd anniversary since Kenya became a republic. Concerns about runaway corruption in government and need to deal a decisive blow on the vice have been expressed by the opposition, civil society and diplomatic missions. And on this occasion, the president was talking tough on corruption and the corrupt. Corruption is our great enemy. We need to fight it with the same tenacity and unity of purpose with which we have fought and won other battles. Corruption is corrosive. Corruption kills. The time has come for Kenyans to fight this vice by mounting a truly national campaign. The president warned that the fight on corruption will spare nobody because corruption is bleeding and hurting Kenyans. No one called to account should ever again hide under the false claim that their community or their religion is under siege. Your community nor your religion were there when you were stealing. President Kenyatta says the own corruption must be sustained and wants to see decisive action from the judiciary. Kenyans want to see those who rob them of their hard-earned money prosecuted and their ill-gotten gains frozen and reclaimed and, and strong and heavy jail terms handed out to these individuals. On Friday, the president issued a gazette notice prohibiting the transfer of property that may have been purchased with funds embezzled from the National Youth Service. The property will be held until all cases relating to the NYS scam are concluded. Still on asset seizures, the president disclosed that the government has either frozen or recovered 2.2 billion shillings of corruptly acquired money and property. Another 200 million shillings held in Swiss accounts in connection with Anglo leasing fraud has also been frozen. We are working with other friendly governments to ensure that illegally acquired assets hidden in their countries are also returned. It does not matter what is required with the proceeds of corruption. Ultimately, all will be forfeited. On the controversial Eurobond, the president accused the opposition of undermining the credibility of government institutions that manage the sovereign bond as well as undermining investor confidence through unsubstantiated claims. The Anti-Corruption Commission is investigating the use of proceeds from Eurobond funds after the opposition accused National Treasury of fraud. Code leader Raila Odinga has maintained he will not comply with the Anti-Corruption Commission's summons to appear before it on Monday over the Eurobond saga despite the commission's threat to prosecute him for failure. Yes. I agree that those entrusted with public positions must be held to account. And if found guilty, the maximum punishment meted out. But the sword of justice cuts both ways. If you make accusations and fail to prove them, you too will also be held accountable. We are prepared to be held to account by all institutions of governance and by Kenyans in their individual capacity or in any other capacity as leaders or as ordinary Kenyans. We are prepared to answer questions of any nature in the use of public funds. Uhuru urged the opposition to engage his government in constructive criticism and not propaganda. <laughs> na kufanya mambo ambayo inaharibu uchumi wa nchi hii kwa sababu jameni unataka wa Kenya waumie kwa sababu unachukia uhuru kama unachukia uhuru ngoja wakati wa uchaguzi ukifika utaenda utakampen nikikushinda ugojee miaka ingine mitano tuendelee 
baada ya hiyo miaka mitano basi mimi nitaondoka dunia iendelee the tough talking president says he's determined to rid his administration of corruption he's brought in the private sector in the war but now he wants to see the judiciary play its role in ensuring that there is faster prosecutions of suspects on those corruption cases Patrick Mimo KTA News Nairobi Aside from corruption issues, President Uhuru Kenyatta explained at length what Kenya can celebrate 52 years after independence. He also listed the mega projects that his government believes will change the face of Kenya, some within the next few months. Muremi Mwangi now reports. As Kenyans from all walks of life commemorated the 52nd year, since chasing colonialists out of the country, President Uhuru Kenyatta was on cue to announce the status of the country in the chase after the dreams of the founding fathers. 1963, there were only 2,219 kilometers of tarmac road. Today, we have 8,879. Head of State says quality education, proper health care and infrastructure remain top on the aspirations of the Kenyan people and that his government is allocating more resources to these sectors. The presidential bursary scheme for orphans and vulnerable children in secondary schools has grown from 1 million shillings in 2012 to 400 million shillings in 2015. In addition, we have allocated sufficient resources for children with disabilities at primary, secondary, and university education. But the Jubilee administration has in recent times come under fire, particularly from the Council of Governors over alleged deliberate delay in the release of funds meant for the free maternity services and the health care in the counties. The Council of Governors occasionally terming this as a deliberate attempt by the Jubilee administration to kill devolution. To increase the number and raise the quality of health care facilities, we have provided medical equipment to level five hospitals in all the counties. I also wish to thank the First Lady also for her support in championing the health of mothers and children through the Beyond Zero campaign. Also in the Jubilee government agenda is a mega geothermal power project, which President Kenyatta says will place the country on the global map as the biggest geothermal power generator by 2022. The Jubilee administration in the past received a fair share of criticism for not delivering on the promise of free laptops for class 1 pupils, with most education stakeholders arguing that the idea was poorly thought out, as most schools have no power connection. But President Kenyatta says there's a solution in hand. Every primary school in Kenya will be connected to electricity by the beginning of the next school term. What this means is our children can now study longer and do better in schools. And as the country strategically repositions itself as the economic hub of the region, President Kenyatta announced that the highly anticipated World Trade Organization 10th Ministerial Conference to be held in Nairobi next week is just a pointer of the country's future fortunes. We are on track in delivering the Jubilee Agenda. The strong statement of President Uhuru Kenyatta on this day that the country is commemorating 52 years since gaining its independence. And he singled out the issues of proper health care, education and infrastructure as crucial to the realization of that agenda. Muremi Mwangi, KTN News, Nairobi. The speakers were few, but a lot was said, especially by President Uhuru Kenyatta. However, unlike almost all major public functions led by Uhuru and Ruto in the last three years, not a single word was uttered about the International Criminal Court. KTN's associate editor Noao Tieno now looks at the elephant in the room and why it was a taboo topic today. Nobel Peace Prize winner Ellen Johnson Sirleaf became president of Liberia on the 23rd of November 2005 
beating legendary footballer George Weah in a runoff election. That was when the UN and the rest of the world really began the hunt for Charles Taylor, who was wanted by the Special Court for Sierra Leone for his involvement in the Sierra Leone Civil War of 1991 to 2002. As Salif was taking oath of office, Taylor was hiding away in exile in Nigeria. Months later, Salif requested the extradition of Taylor and Taylor was arrested by the UN and taken into detention at the Hague Penitentiary. Taylor was found guilty by the special court and sentenced in May 2012 to 50 years in prison for 11 counts relating to war crimes and crimes against humanity. Mr. Taylor, for the foregoing reasons, the trial chamber unanimously sentences you to a single term of imprisonment of 50 years. But for the people of Liberia, that is only half the story. The real festering wounds opened by Taylor in Liberia relate to the first Liberian civil war of 1989 to 1996, where 200,000 people died, and the second Liberian civil war of 1999 to 2003, by which time he was president. By the time the Sierra Leone court was looking for him, at least one third of his own country, Liberia, was against him. Many believe that Taylor's indictment, prosecution, and sentencing was good news for Liberia first before it was good news for Sierra Leone. Hence, Liberia's respect and deference for the special court. So, today, although the International Criminal Court did not specifically try or sentence Taylor, it would have been awkward for the Kenyan top two leaders to publicly go on the offensive against the ICC because one of their honored guests was the leader of a country forever grateful for the intervention of the international community when it mattered most. And that guest, too, took over the presidency from the man now denied freedom courtesy of international cooperation and support. That, perhaps, could explain why the ICC was a taboo topic at the 52nd Jamhuri Day celebrations. Neither Salif... Appreciation for the role that Kenya has played in Liberia's own fight. Nor Uhuru Kenyatta... President, as you have noted, our own Army Commander, Lieutenant General Leonard Gondi, led the UN peace mission in Liberia between 2012 and 2015 uttered a word against the ICC. <laughs> now, you know, KTN News. And up north in Garissa County, the County Commissioner James Kianda has sounded a stern warning to local chiefs and their assistants, whom he said have abandoned their duty post and are instead operating from Garissa town because of insecurity. The Commissioner said that the administrators risk losing their jobs and called on members of the public to report such insubordination to him. The local chiefs are said to be camped out in Garissa town under the guise of following up on their salaries. Ninatoa ombi pia wa wananchi mlioko hapa. Hii Ngarisa town iko na machifu wake na mnawajua. Hii Ngarisa town iko na ma assistant chief wake na mnawajua. Lakini kama mtu ni chief wa ijara, assistant chief wa ijara, assistant chief wa ulugo kama sub county wa Lagdera, wa Mbalambala na anaishi hapa. That is corruption number 1. Because yeye anakula mshahara Lakini wanainji wanaendelea kuhumia kule. Wanajua vizuri chiva yuko wanakaa garisa. So we are giving a warning to all these civil servants. Ya kwamba from this moment, sisi tutachukua atua. We will even take you to the corruption. Because unakula pesa ya, ya, ya serikali. Unakula pesa ya mwanainji ya metuwa ushuru. Lakini wewe ukai mahali pako kwa kazi. Na nyinyi wanainji, you are the first whistleblowers. Ukiona chief, amekuja na anaishi kwa bula. Na amemaliza siku tano. I was the governor at Abuja Mushara. For your information, Mwajua Senator and the MPs, we get our salaries very early. You is starting to complain. By the 22nd of this month, my salary is going to be in the bank. So I have no business. Kusema ya kwamba niko hapa mpaka tare mbili, tare tatu, ya mwezi unawafuata, ati natafuta Mushara. 
still in Kenya and now to Kiambu County. The governor there, William Kabogo, has asked Area County Commissioner Alex Ngoyo to stop what he called indulging in local politics and focus more on his duties. The governor was speaking during the Jamuhuri Day ceremony in Kiambu where he demanded that security issues in the area be addressed for the sake of the community. Peter, tumefanya kazi vizuri na wao. Lakini naonekana kuna mahali tangu juzi watu wanataka kutegemea siasa. I want to send this message clear. Mambo ya siasa, I am a professor of politics. Wewe kama mahali umetoka umekuja hapa kufanya siasa, tutapambana kisiasa. And we shall not allow an individual, no matter who it is, kuja hapa na kufikiri tutaanza kufanya kazi kulingana na mapenzi kama matakwa yake. Lakini kadanda ya siasa ni tamu kwangu mimi I enjoy it. It's part of my life. But we will not allow politics to come in between ourselves and the service to the people. Because we are elected and our job is to serve. Na wewe ukifikiri kuna mtu uko naye juu yangu atutapiga simu kila ukipata nafasi unachomoka nje kupigia fulani simu wewe piga hizo simu I don't work on phone calls from anywhere about those who know me you're watching KTN Weekend Prime. Thank you so much for staying with us. But if you can, please do continue to stay with us. We still have lots in store for you, including Kenya's good news coming from Cape Town on the Shuja team that triumphed against South Africa and just a few minutes ago, Zimbabwe as well. We'll be back shortly. Good evening. This is KTN News. Welcome back to KTN Weekend Prime. We are glad you're watching. Now, panic is rising by the day at over 40 El Nino rescue camps in Garsen, Tana River County. Over 40,000 displaced persons now stare at a possible humanitarian crisis three weeks after decamping their home to higher grounds. As KTN's Coast reporter Francis Ontomo reports, access to water, food, medication, and other basic non-food essentials have become a mirage. Take a look. Halova rescue camp, Garsen. Countless makeshift tents fight for space. Many of them shaky and stand precariously without rooftops. Desolate faces of hungry children and panicked mothers send an uncomfortable aura of desperation. Indeed, a typical struggle for existence that has gripped this location following days of heavy rains upstream. And those feeling the pinch more are children, mothers, and the elderly. El Nino kutoka ilipoanza huko maji ya mefurika. Imebidi wengine tuhamie huku, hatuna mahali ya kukaa. Dho kuna tuna majumba huko lakini sasa maisha sana sana si unajua ni shambani. Matatizo makubwa yanayotukumba ni hali ya ukosefu wa chakula, magonjwa kwa watu wazima, mahoma, matumbo na hata kwa watoto. Ndicho kitu ambacho kwa zaidi kinatuhangaisha. The Kenya Red Cross Society says that about 8,086 households have been displaced from their homes in Tana River County, and half the population is made up of children. Many of them suffer from malaria and pneumonia. Some women we learn have been forced to deliver in the camps in unhealthy conditions. Kuna mama mwingine hapa ameenda hospitali. Kuna mtoto wake pia mama ameenda hospitali na mtoto pia ni mgonjwa. Yuko hapo. Hasa ikawa hakuna mtu akumhudumia tunamsaidia tu sisi hapa kwa kampu manake mama yake hayuko. This small boy has been sleeping on this mat for hours. It is deep into afternoon, but since daybreak he has not eaten anything. Sadly, we learn that his mother too has left to seek medication at a medical center a few miles from here. And although we are not able to establish his illness, judging from his sickly demeanor, the boy needs urgent help. Hakuna mtu yoyote ambesha kuja hapa kutuona. Alie kuja hapa ni mtu mmoja wa Catholics kutoka Malindi Diocese. Na walikuja wakatutembelea jana na wakarudi wakasema tungojee report. Records by the Kenya Red Cross Society indicate that there are 39 other IDP centers in this locality. Majority of the victims being children below the age of 12, all in dire need of relief, food and medical supplies. This even as tough questions now emerge on where the money set aside to deal with El Nino effects by both the national and county governments have been directed to. Tana River County set aside some 50 million Kenyan shillings to deal with this. 
but his families feel ignored. Watoto nasumbuliwa na homa na tumbo ya kuendesha na kifua. So we are appealing to all well wishers to assist, but we have done what we have done so far is to serve the most vulnerable. We are not reaching everybody. Affected areas in the region include Bububu, Masabubu, Boji, Hola in Galole constituency, and Itsowe, Kipau, and Kipini. Over 14 villages in Tana Delta sub county have so far been washed away. Francis Ontomwa, KTN News, Garsen, Tana River County. A Chinese primary school pupil set two new world records at an international rope skipping contest, racking up 108 skips in 30 seconds. He broke the world skipping records at the first world inter-school rope skipping championships in Dubai. Tricks in Gada reports. Shen from Guangzhou City skipped an impressive 108 times in 30 seconds and 548 times in 3 minutes at the Nad Al Sheba Sports Arena. That's almost 4 skips per second, a feat very few human beings can pull off. Organizers said it was very hard to count the jumps manually at the side of the court and the results were finally confirmed after watching the feat in slow motion. Students from Shenzhen Primary School won 27 medals from a total of 29 categories, China's state broadcaster CCTV reported. In an interview, Shen tried to explain that to skip that fast, you have to sway the rope very fast and keep your upper body steady. The next World Championships are expected to take place in Sweden in July. Other contenders will need all the luck in the world to break Shen's world record. Trick Singado, KTN News. Good evening and welcome back to KTN Weekend Prime. We're glad you're watching. Now as the World Trade Organization Ministerial Conference begins next week, there are expectations that the meeting will help inject at least 2.6 billion shillings into the Kenyan economy. But what is in it for ordinary traders and farmers? Well, KTN's Masikandiana looks at the lot of farmers and what they are grappling with. Mze Koto Koto enjoys his tea as much as his old age. He's been farming since the 70s. What time has taught him, he says, is that the more things change, the more they become the same. At his home in Wasingishu County, one of the country's bread basket, this is the output of his 10-acre land he harvested recently. <laughs> That's as good as it can get. Mze Kotokoto uses at least 12,000 shillings on an acre. That's good news when the government has issued some subsidy on the farming input. But it's not good enough. His maize is in the store. The prices are too low to make any profit. His story in this part of the country is very common, shared by many who are looking into alternatives to maize farming. The 10th World Trade Organization will be held in Nairobi, Kenya from the 15th to 18th of December 2015. The WTO, an international intergovernmental organization dealing with the formulation and implementation of international trade rules, should have some impact on such farmers. The idea behind the creation of WTO is very noble. If you look at even the content of those agreements, the content of what is there in the WTO, everything is okay. But now the real issue is the, the hypocrisy that exists within those powerful nations. Isaac Keror is an economist and development studies specialist. The meeting, he says, never favors developing countries like Kenya, opting instead for regional adjustments to make agriculture more favorable to farmers. The cost of producing maize in Uganda is very low because of climate. The cost of producing maize in Uganda is very low because of fertility. But the cost of production in Kenya is very high. Say that even with this subsidy, it doesn't. 
that's unsafe. We allow specialization to take place so that maybe farmers in the near future will be told if Uganda is producing this, and remember we are members of East Africa community, if Uganda will be told to specialize in maize as we change into other products that are very marketable, and the get time, they will save us a lot of costs of production. One of the WTO's objective is to raise the standards of living for its members. Keror says conversations at the conference should be more genuine, especially among developed countries. These people are there to promote their trade, not to help us progress. And if it was there, 1995 to 2015 is around 20 years meaning that us Africans, Latin America, and other developing countries would have had very smooth flow of goods from one particular, from developed to developed country. Mze Kotokoto says he is learning other alternatives. He is now wiser and has diversified his agribusiness to more than just maize farming. One day, he says, he will only plant maize for food, not for sale. Masikandie KTN News, Wasingishu County.